morning, everyone. We're going to spend a little bit of time today talking about SCPs and how you can use them to get the least privilege. I'm Sandy Bird. I'm the CTO of Sunry Security. I've spent about the last four years of my life trying to get the least privilege in AWS accounts by editing individual policies on individual identities. And after doing that for four years, I'm quite frustrated, actually, because it never seems to stop. There's always new identities showing up. And so AWS over the years has added more and more functionality around SCPs and the way that they work and other kind of functionality in the IAM model. And we're finally at the point we can get to most of least privilege actually using some of these centralized controls. And so before we did this, we did a bunch of kind of analysis of AWS customers. People that had 20 accounts, people that had 800 accounts. What did the identity space look like after you had been in cloud for five or six years? You're not brand new starting in cloud. You have a history with cloud. And there's a couple interesting things that come out of this. If you look at identities that have sensitive permissions, and for this we'll define a sensitive permission as something that can do pretty drastic changes to your cloud. Change a route table, create a VPC, create a pre-signed URL, you know, modify the backup policy, these types of things. Things you can do real damage with. And out of all of the identities provisioned in these large cloud accounts that have been there for five years, almost half of the identities have at least one of these sensitive permissions granted to it. But what is more interesting is out of that half, only 8% of those identities have ever used it in the last 90 days. So think about all that dormant uh, kind of identity risk sitting out there. As I said, we used to go and say, let's take all of those identities and give them least privileged policies. But people seem to struggle to do that. The next thing which is really interesting about this space is when we look at what's used and not used. And the longer you've been in cloud, the more zombies you have. Basically identities that are sitting there, they haven't been used in a long period of time. You know, we used for the statistic of this, we used 90 days to figure out what a zombie was. But when you look at the stats, there are people that have identities that haven't been used in five years sitting in AWS. Very long periods of time. High percentages, 61%. But the next thing which is interesting is, let's take a look at those based on people identities versus machine identities. And this is where something very telling comes out about our organizations. And I tell this story, I was talking to the IAM head of a pharmaceutical. Great guy, has been in identity for a lot of years. And we were talking about the problem of least privilege in AWS. And he said to me, we actually have this under control. We have SSO set up with Okta, we monitor all the identities. We have a great process for when developers change jobs, they actually get the right set of permissions. And I said, but what about all those machine identities that are sitting in your cloud? And he kind of looked at me with a blank stare at the time, thinking, well, why do I have to worry about those? This is why they never get cleaned up. So we as companies have built this great process for identity with people as they join the company, as they move jobs, as they leave the company, we can remove them only 7% of them are left in the cloud. But when you look at the machine identities, when the developers finished with version A of the app and moved to version B of the app, all the version A identities got left behind, right? And so you have this problem of this continual growth of unused identities building up. But when you start to ask people, well, let's just go delete them. We can prove it hasn't been used in five years. Why don't you just delete it? We have a, we have a bot for that. There's a one-click protection for that, I think, in Wiz or something. There's lots of ways to delete it, but no one will do it. Why? And there's two reasons people give you. One is, it's supposed to be there. It's a break glass account. We can have an argument if you should have break glass accounts or not. But the reality is, that's kind of a sad excuse. If it hasn't been used in five years, maybe you have a different way of doing critical controls. The second reason is, I don't know how to put it back. It has a set of permissions that have been configured. It has resource policies that you know, use that identity attached to a S3 bucket or something. I don't know how I would ever put that identity back. It has an access key. If you destroy the material, I can't get the material back. That's why people won't do it. So there's a better way to deal with this, and we'll talk about that in a minute, also using SCPs. But this is just a classic example of this. In a company with about 30 to 50 AWS accounts, after five years, they start to look at something like 35,000 identities, 26,000 of them are unused, 152 of the AWS services they don't ever use, but all of this is enabled in all of those accounts as they go through this. So how do we start to look at this instead of actually trying to fix all 36,000 of those identities? Because that's what you'd have to do. Go to identity one, create a least privilege policy for it, apply it, 
Then you would actually go and test that, probably because developers aren't going to just put that into production. They like to have some testing. So they would put it in stage, they'd test it, it would work, they'd move it to production, one identity at least privilege. And they would rinse and repeat that process 36,000 times. At some point in time, you can't do that. You just run out of man hours for doing it. And so this kind of process, we had a really successful customer do this. They got through 2,000 identities in 10 months. And if you really looked at their accounts after that 10 months, they probably created 2,000 more identities. And so the reality is you just cannot get ahead in this model. So we said, look, what if we used SCPs? But instead of looking at 14,000 individual permissions in AWS, let's look at the stuff that's really bad. There's really only about 1,000 of those permissions. There's not 14,000 of them. And what if we controlled denying these from an SCP instead of actually doing individual policies? Now, if you've been in AWS for a while and you've used SCPs and you've broken something, this sounds a bit scary. Because if you've put an SCP in place and then somebody got denied and then you had to back out all these rules to figure this out, it was because you didn't understand what identities were using those permissions. So when you took them away, it was like a big hammer and say, no one can do this anymore. So you do need to do some analytics to do it. But if you can actually see what identities are using which permissions, you can start to build a map that says these are the right ones that need exemptions for these 1,000 permissions that are used. And so we came up with this model that said there are four individual things that you can actually do in an SCP centrally to deny globally without touching any of the other policies in the account. And this uses several concepts. It uses SCPs, it uses attribute-based access, it uses a bunch of different controls in AWS that exist but allow you to scale this across 800, 1,000 accounts with you know, 500,000 identities in them and still be able to do each one of these controls. The first one we talked about, take those 1,000 permissions, deny them by default, but give them back access to the 7% that use them. The second one is those zombies, those identities that have been there that you're scared to delete. Let's not delete them. Let's actually, if you know AWS's policies, deny wins, any deny wins. So all you have to do is make sure that somehow on those identities you put a deny star on them and they don't work anymore. So now those identities don't work. But you haven't destroyed the access key. You haven't destroyed the permissions that they have. They still work. Same thing in unused services. If you look at, there's lots of different ways to get billing material out of AWS, figure out what services you're using. If you're not using them, let's turn them off. You say, well, why would I do that? Well, maybe I buy my AI resources from some other company. I'm not doing AWS with that, so I want to turn them off in AWS so I don't have a double bill. I have one from Anthropic, I've got one from you know, Microsoft, and I have one from AWS. I want everybody using Anthropic, so let's just turn them off in the AWS world. Maybe there's scenarios where you don't want people using them because they're not certified for HIPAA workloads. You got HIPAA, you don't want to use them for that, let's turn them off. So there's ways you can do this across the board for these four controls. Now, if you're thinking about your teams though, what you realize pretty quickly is this works great for today. I do all this analytics, I figure out which services I use, I figure out which identities, which permissions, I build this massive map, and I put it in place, and today is a happy day, and then tomorrow everything breaks. And the reason it breaks tomorrow is, remember that application A that became application B and left all of its identities? Well, now they build application C with a whole new set of identities, and those need sensitive permissions, but they're not in this mapping that I previously built. I found that the build role and Maurice Moss needed them but now I've got application C in there and it needs to do it. This is again where AWS gives us great tools for this. They have a way to know when an identity tries to do something, it trips into a rule. If you've ever seen explicit deny by SCP in your CloudTrail logs, you're familiar with this concept, right? And so when you see that message, you now know that somebody has tripped over one of these rules and now you can trigger a flow. So we at Sunry use you know, chat ops for this, but you could do it using any way that you want. And so what we do is we trigger a message saying, hey, by the way, this application just tried to do something that it's never done before. Do you want to allow this? Yes. And as soon as you say yes, we change the model in AWS, and they can continue about their job, do the daily work, and they're not blocked. So within 10 seconds of actually being denied that first time, you can give them back that permission. Now, if you think about it, you say, man, I'm going to be pressing these buttons a lot. But it's not actually true. When you actually look at the 7% are the only identities that ever use that, most of them use them over and over and over again, but the number of net new identities that actually use these permissions is super low. How many times do you create a VPC in an account? You do a lot when you're building the workload, you really don't use it after the workload's been there for a year, you don't change the VPC settings. And so by doing this, you end up with very low numbers of what we call permissions on demand requests for these sensitive permissions. And so you get this kind of rapid upstart by using these SCPs. You get this great centralized control. You get this kind of immediate 
move to least privilege. It's not perfect least privilege. It's one of the things I had to get over when we were actually building this model. I had to basically resign myself from it's not perfect least privilege. It's only these thousand permissions. But when we looked at all the red team exercises against our accounts, when somebody popped something, it was like, hey, we had Git actions wired to this identity in AWS, and it could create new users. And so what it did was it created a new user that then the red team used to bounce into the account and do all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's look at that identity. It's never created a user in its life. Why did it have access to do that? Well, it was Git actions. We had it configured with Star. Of course you did. You didn't know what it was going to do. But you probably didn't need to let it create VPCs, create new access keys, those types of things. So you get kind of a, out of the way of the developer. You can actually use self-approval where those kind of chat op messages or whatever you use for a flow go directly to the developers themselves. Let them self-approve the need for these things. But the 92%, because they never use them, never get asked for and they always stay denied. And what a great early warning system when somebody that's not supposed to get access to the identity gets access to it and you tell the team, by the way, the GitOps role just tried to create an access key at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I didn't do that, why did that happen, right? So it becomes that great early warning system as well. So we have a couple options here. We can do a little bit of Q&A, and I also have kind of a click through of what we make this look like from a user experience. So I'm actually gonna stop and pause for a second. If somebody has a question, let's maybe let you ask those. But if not, we have a couple other slides. Anyone have a question? Everyone's shy this morning? We have prizes. I'm sure Joseph standing at the back would find you a prize for a great question. Go ahead. Oh, probably through the... <laughs> okay. So uh, what's the organization look like that you're applying this to? Are you doing this kind of at an OU or root level, or are you doing it to individual accounts? Because obviously yeah. we have a limit of five SCPs per account or OU. So yeah. how does that work? There is... Uh, so again, to repeat the question for the people that didn't hit it, where are you applying these rules in the SCPs? And there's these weird limits in SCPs that Amazon has. You can only have so many SCPs. The SCPs can only be a certain size, and you can only attach five of them at any given point in your tree. It's really painful. Everyone go do a feature request right now. This is we want more SCP space. So at Sunry, if you're using our solution, we have a whole bunch of really interesting compression technology we use to make the SCPs as small as possible. But if you're doing it, there's a couple of tricks you can use to actually do this. One is um, not everything you do needs to be applied at the top of the tree. You can use the other levels of your OUs to actually implement those. And there's a great cheat in AWS where you get five levels, but say you're only using four, you stick another one at the top and now you have 10. So there's, there's some cool tricks you can apply that way. When we do this, we often, because we're building these maps, we often apply them where they need to be. So it's often they're deployed at other parts of the OU, they're not all at the top, um, but again, Depending on how you're doing it, you'll want to do that. The other thing you can do is, again, do some lookups on things like attribute-based access. You can cheat in some of your SCPs by using other mechanisms of the cloud to scale things. So, Anyone else? All right, let's click through a couple of things. Um, there's a great demo of this running at the Sunry booth, which is right behind the Cisco booth. You can see the Cisco booth there on the other side. Joseph has phenomenal swag over there. There's all kinds of great shirts over there. There's ways to win an Oculus something or other. There's all kinds of stuff. So the way this looks like in our product, if you happen to choose to do it our way, is we build a map of all of the services and all of what we consider the sensitive permissions. This is a great head start because we found the thousand sensitive permissions already for you, which is quite nice. When you go into any one of these, we will find in any given account what the exemptions are. So we'll find out that you have 10 roles that actually do create VPCs or they actually do use other sensitive permissions. You actually put those in protect. When you actually do that, what happens is it goes up into pending changes and basically you deploy the SCP. So we don't have permission to change your cloud. We just give you the infrastructure as code to do this. Great safety mechanism for yourself. But you don't have, back to your point of where do you apply these, it doesn't have to be at the top. You can start by saying, look, I just want to fix the sandbox accounts because it's the wild west in there and I, people are doing stuff I don't want. So let's just fix the sandbox accounts. So you can go in and choose that. From there, you kind of get these beautiful views of like, okay, well, what has sensitive permissions that are not using it? And you can go through and say that, well, all of these um, identities have access to sensitive permission, but they've never, ever used them. So let's actually put them in protect mode. You put them in protect mode. That also goes into your changes. You apply that thing. We give you those, those SCPs and changes for that. That gets you to protection. What this looks like for your user in AWS is they basically just get a standard error message when they try to bump into one of these. So I may be logged in as the administrator here. I'm logged in as Kerrigan. Maybe I have star access. 
I tried to do something you should never do. If you were in the last lightning talk, they said, please move away from IAM users. We all agree, stop using IAM users. But say you do and you create an access key one with one, what happens is you just get a quick deny like that. Immediately when you do that, you get a message in Slack saying, hey, by the way, Kerrigan was just access, uh, denied access to creating an access key. Do you want to allow this? You hit allow, go back into AWS, press the button again, now it works. That whole transaction takes less than 20 seconds to get that permission back, super fast. The other thing you can do is, most of you will have automations that you use to bootstrap accounts. So a new account shows up, you want to put a bunch of identities in it, you have to do a bunch of stuff to put infrastructure in it, you hopefully delete the v default VPC, you do all these good things. That identity has to run sensitive permissions. So you can just drop that in as an exemption, and that identity will continue to be allowed to do the types of things that it always does. So guys, that's all I wanted to do today. Hopefully that was useful for everyone. If you visit Joseph and the crew over at the booth, there's lots of great swag and things. Tell them you were sat through the lightning talk and they'll give you amazing swag. And if you have any questions after, I'll be over there. Feel free to stop by and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for the great session.